we go. So we'll start in a minute or so, just wait for a few others to come in. Very good. There you go, take your pen back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you've got the books for... Yeah, okay, that's great. So, I think we'll make a start, and others will probably come in if they're uh, coming in specially for the meeting. Uh, we're going to have two talks um, separated with a 20-minute break. Uh, in between, so uh, hopefully you'll manage because this this is um, this is an interesting talk, and I'm going to try and make sure that we get it in good time. And I hope that you'll enjoy it. it this one's on flights, which I'm just about to start, and then there'll be another talk, which will be uh, reconnecting the gospel to a godless culture. And then tomorrow, if you are not going to your own church. That's up to you, but um, if you wish to come to tomorrow, I will be speaking in the morning on creation, so what is the issue? And I'll also be doing something on fossils for the young children as well. So um, there will be some exhibits, and I'm not one of them, even though I might look like a fossil. And uh, Simon, who, is, uh, who spoke earlier, he will be speaking tomorrow um, on taking a stand in the battle for the family in the evening again at this church. So that is at 6 o'clock. I will be speaking in the morning at 11.30. So that's entirely up to you. You're probably some of you from other churches. Can I also say that I have, um, I have a prayer letter list. So if you would like to be on my personal prayer letter which I send out not too often. It's usually about three or four times a year. It's not as frequent as I might like it to be sometimes because I'm fairly busy with many things. But I do send it out, and I will notify you of things coming up. Can I remind you about the, the Truth in Science uh, publicity, which I mentioned earlier? There is this leaflet, which is available. Please go and to the bookstall, and you'll see a number of them there. That's on the 30, 30th and 31st of August. So it's a few months away yet, but please would you encourage young people to come to that. And then a bit later on, October the 31st to November the 2nd, myself and others, Stuart Burgess, and of course Simon Turpin will be speaking at that. He's also speaking at the Truth in Science conference. So please do have a look at those, and we'll have a book plug on this matter of flight at the end. Neil will come up with talking about some books. Flight has always been a fascination for me. I've loved it, and uh, I've also tried to do a little bit of learning to fly, but um, I decided in the end that the Lord was calling me to primarily be doing creation ministry and uh, it's a very expensive thing to do flying. I love going with others who do do it. I had the joy of flying in a small aeroplane when I was recently in the US and uh, I, I may get another opportunity a bit later on. So I love going to displays like this one which was some years ago in uh, near San Diego in California. Just watch this
one of the most dangerous maneuvers when you have this knife edge pass, as it's called, when two aeroplanes are going straight towards each other and just divert right at the last fractions of a second. It all began in terms of human flight and using flying machines with these two men who, in their jobs, in their careers, were what? Anybody know? Bicycle makers from Dayton in Ohio. They didn't have any degrees, but they built, they built an aircraft for the first controlled, man-made, controlled, heavier-than-air machine. Two brothers, Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright. The bright cookie was really Wilbur, the one on the right, and the one who sort of did all the displays was often Orville. They were both pretty clever people, and their first flight, of course, was on December the 17th, 1903, at Kitty Hawk, just off the coast of North Carolina. I hope to go and visit that, actually. It's quite an amazing spot, very windy spot, which uh, there on that December day, they flew roughly the, in, on the first flight uh, the length of a Boeing 747. But uh, by the end of the day, they'd actually flown a lot further. Flight isn't simple. It's not just a matter of putting feathers on your arms and hoping for the best. Neither is it cheating, which these guys did because they used a hot air balloon. We're talking about heavier than air flight. And frankly, flight is staggering in its complexity. One of the most amazing machines was Concorde. There it is on its last flight as it lands at Bristol, in uh, Filton Airfield in Bristol. An amazing machine, way ahead of its time. And I've always enjoyed uh, watching what people have done in building aeroplanes. And uh, when I was at... Uh, some years ago at the uh, Farnborough Air Display, I had the privilege of seeing the Vulcan flying again, which is now grounded. Let's talk about, though, the flight in nature, the flight of birds. Six wonders of designs in birds I'm going to consider. Feathers, the control of flight, hovering, bone and muscle structure, breathing, and then I'm going to end with some clever systems, which birds have. And again, the issue of irreducible complexity comes in here. I need something again from my... I didn't quite prepare correctly. I'm sorry. I've left it in here, and I should have had it out. There is an important part which I need for this talk, and I should have got it out. <clears throat> sorry about this. So... Birds, of course, have feathers, and I need to mention to you some aspects of feathers. And I've got some feathers with me, which is going to help me just to demonstrate some of the issues. Birds are actually using feathers in a remarkable way, and where feathers are placed on a wing is not just random. Primary feathers are towards the edge of the wing, secondary feathers are further in, tertiary feathers are further in, still close to the body of the bird. And then as you go forward, there are covering feathers. They're labelled usually covert feathers. And then there is primary, secondary or greater coverts, and then lesser coverts and median coverts. And then you've got feathers which are on the tail. Those are called retrices. So no feather is the same as another feather. Uh, on any one bird, all the feathers are never the same as one another. You might get a primary feather from, uh, say, from an eagle, and that would be similar if it comes from the same location as another bird's, uh, another eagle's uh, primary feather. But for a given bird, no two feathers are ever the same. It's really quite remarkable. Every feather has to be placed in the right location looking down on the bird's wing. 
But then when you consider the bird's wing end on, or any aerofoil shape, even a modern aircraft aerofoil shape, you'll know that it is actually very important that the wind is made to actually go over the upper surface and in the lower surface in a slightly different way, which then, as I showed you at the beginning, causes a force which is due to the fact that the, f the flow has been bent. All flow is which, it, which is bent has an equal and opposite reaction force to it. That's what I always try to teach my students at the University of Leeds, and they didn't always get it. Even those who were training to be pilots didn't understand what lift really was. It's a reaction force to the bending of the flow. You could have bent it with anything. As long as it's, the flow is turned, then there's an equal and opposite reaction to that turning. But as I was indicating, the aerofoil shape for a bird, of course, is composed edge on of essentially mainly feathers. So when you look at a bird's wing, which I'm showing you here, is actually... Um, Oh dear, I kind of lost my pointer. Where on earth did I put my pointer? I thought I had it on me. Oh dear, I'm not well prepared, am I? Sorry, I've lost my pointer. It must be again down here. I don't know where I've put it. Oh, I thought I had it on me. It must be in here. No, I don't know where I put my pointer. I thought I had it here. Um, oh, it's in here. Sorry. Right. Sorry about this. When you actually look at a bird's wing, you can see that it's thicker at the front than at the end. So now if we look at a bird wing, a photograph of a bird wing, do you see the aerofoil shape on this white-tailed eagle from the Isle of Mull, which I took some years ago? And it's a an incredible bird when you see a white-tailed eagle which has a wingspan of uh, getting on for eight feet. So it's a very large bird. And you can see the aerofoil shape. And uh, it's shown again as it turns in this picture. And look at the way that this wing surface, as you look at it from end on, or you look at it, in this case, from, from the front, you can see this aerofoil shape, and that is composed essentially of a building up of feathers. So not only must you have the feathers in the right location looking down on the bird wing, you must actually have the feathers building up the shape of the aerofoil looking end on. So all these things indicate amazing design, and the aerodynamic excellence of birds is because the feathers are all put in exactly the right place. This is a red kite, pictures taken by my friend Colin Mitchell. And by the way, his book on the turtle dove is on the bookstore. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, brilliant photographer, and he took these pictures of the red kite. A lot of them have been reintroduced into Wales, and if you go to Gigrin Farm, in the middle of Wales, you'll often see a whole flock of red kites uh, feeding, which is really quite remarkable. Now, is evolution true? Did birds emerge from some lizard-like reptile? Is that really what happened? Frankly, it's evident that this is just not the case when we look at the evidence. Because when you consider the way feathers begin, they don't come from the same part of the surface as scales of a reptile. The keratin, yes, is essentially the same, although there are some uh, differences between the type of keratin in feathers and scales on a reptile. But we'll just leave that point just for the moment. Is it true when this book, written by a Japanese gentleman, called Fatuma, when this book says 
The feather has the same fundamental structure and development as a reptilian scale. Is that true? No, it's totally false. Because the keratin of a scale emerges from a very different process near the surface than the keratin of a feather which grows from a follicle not too dissimilar to hair follicles, although having said that, they're not totally the same because a hair is actually not got the structure, of course, of what a feather has, which I will show you in a moment. Feathers grow from follicles, which is rather like a tube, like you have for a big pen, right? So if I grab a feather which I have here, which is why I needed to just retrieve them, if I show you that in the growth of a feather from a follicle, it looks a bit like that as it is being drawn out of the tube, which I've represented by this big pen ex uh, external part, and then it grows and is placed in exactly the right position on the bird wing. And the follicle is the means by which the feather is actually fed with information to cause it to grow inside the tube, which is the follicle. Once the job is done, then the follicle disintegrates because it's made of very, very, very thin keratin again, which just crumbles away. So when a bird has molted, you'll see lots of dust. What's the dust from? From the disintegrating follicles. So the follicle, as I say, is like a tube with the growth collar at the base, connected to the body of the bird. And the feather grows inside the follicle and then emerges and is placed in exactly the right position for the feather to work. This is a young pigeon which fell out of a tree. We called, nicknamed it Humpty Dumpty. We couldn't keep it alive. But uh, we learned an awful lot about uh, the feathers, as you can see. You can see the tubes here, uh, the follicles where the feathers are growing. And you can see that it's a very sensible way to do things. Because if you didn't have the follicles, the feathers would interfere with each other as they were growing. So they are placed in exactly the right position. Once they're in the right position, then the follicle disintegrates. And there you are, you've got the feather in the right location. Uh, the, the reason why we couldn't uh, feed the bird was because we hadn't understood that we should be giving it coke. Uh, it needs basically a liquid uh, sugar-based drink in order to actually survive. So if we ever got another one, we now know what to do. But uh, it was a pity, actually. We couldn't keep the bird alive. But we hadn't understood what to do. We were very much a learners in those days. But... <laughs> <coughs> Let me tell you something else about feathers. <clears throat> <clears throat> the way a feather holds together is a marvel of lightweight engineering. I see there's a young man uh, right on the edge of the row there. Would he like to join me and do a little experiment? Because I'm going to do something which I'd like you to copy. Come and join me, right? I'm going to separate... The barbs on a feather, right? What's your name, young man? Jonah. Jonah, right. I want you to watch what I do, and I'm going to ask you to do the same, to prove that this isn't magic, right? So, Jonah, I want you to watch what I do. I'm holding the feather by its barbs, and then I separate the barbs. You see, I've separated the barbs. And I'm going to do something which is frankly amazing when you think about what's happening. If I put my finger, forefinger and my thumb over this very carefully, I can make that which was separated come back together again as though it was magic. 
what's going on. Now, Jonah, would you like to try and do the same? Right? So just separate it somewhere, yeah? You can separate it there. That's fine. Don't worry about it. You can be quite definite. Now, put your finger and thumb over the very place. Should we just show them, first of all? Should we just show them, first of all? Right? So this is where Jonah had separated it, all right? Now Jonah's going to put his finger and thumb over there. Yeah, no, you need to put it over the gap, right? You need to get your thumb right over to where it was separated and then pull it together. Yeah, there we are, he's done it. See, it's not, it's not magic. Well done, Jonah, give him a clap. Yeah, well done. So what is going on at the microscopic level? Let's have a look on this diagram here. You will see that I've got a starling secondary feather there. You can see, by the way, the iridescence, which is really rather lovely on a magpie. I uh, don't particularly like the magpies, the big, big bullies, but uh, their plumage is beautiful. What's actually happening is that the main stem is here, right? These barbs are here, right? Those are the barbs. You could see the barbs, but what you couldn't see, Jonah, was at the microscopic level, there are barbules, mini barbs. Think of them as mini barbs, right? The barbules, which are going, we'll call them the right-handed barbules, because as you come out on the barb, you've got right-handed barbules, and they have little hooks on. Okay, hooks. But the left-handed barbules, which are these ones, sorry, I beg your pardon, I've said it the wrong way around. The right-handed ones have ridges. I apologize, I've said it the wrong way around. The right-handed ones have ridges. And the left-handed, left which are these ones, are the ones with hooks. So the left-handed barbules are actually going over the right-handed barbules, the right-handed barbule from an adjacent barb, okay? So they interfere with one another, but in a very deliberate way. They actually, the hooks slide over the right-handed barbules, the left-handed ones with hooks slide over those ridges. Here's an actual picture down a, uh, down a strong microscope, which shows you the left-handed uh, left um, ones that we were referring to there lying over the right-handed ridges. So it's a bit like curtain rails with curtain rail hooks sliding over the rails. So even though you might have thought, that it was just barbs you were looking at there. There are actually barbules, which actually, if you look very closely, you can see a, what looks like a fur-like substance. That is the barbules. You can just see that there are barbules there. So when I run my finger over that feather, I can join it back together again. Isn't that clever? What mutation had any knowledge that it had to be left-handed and different to a right-handed barbule. If it was just a frayed bit of a scale from a reptile, how could it possibly, without a mind, have formed this system? Again, it's irreducibly complex. But if you've got this system, which I've just been describing, and you've got You've got ridges sliding over, uh, or hooks sliding over ridges. Then you've got, a, really, you've got some wearing going on, and eventually the feather will begin to get worn. So for a sliding joint, which is really what you've got at the microscopic level, you need something to stop that happening and keep the feather well, uh, uh, well, keep it from getting too worn out. What do you think it needs? 
If you're an engineer, you know where you've got something sliding over another thing, you, you need oil. Where does a bird get its oil from? Anybody know? That's right. Well, it's not its chest. It's right at the back of its spine. Right down at the bottom of its spine. Now, I'd like to do an experiment with you. You've had just had your some food to eat. You might find it difficult to do even if you didn't have food to eat. If you turn your neck 180 degrees and put the equivalent of the beat, which would be the end of the nose, onto the bottom of your spine, none of you can do it. Not even first thing in the morning or last thing at night. You can't do it. But a bird can. Look at this pelican. Easily does it. So you see that there are many things which have to be right just for a feather to work. One feather. And a bird has a multitude, thousands of feathers. And no feather is the same as another one. Was that the same in the so-called I don't accept the years here, 99 million years. I don't accept that at all. I believe that's not true. This is actually almost certainly from the flood and uh, oozing resin from a tree has hardened and become amber and it's picked up a feather with it. And somebody has found this trapped in amber, which people have around their necks. Ladies will wear amber. It's very light substance when it becomes hard. But how interesting, this supposedly 99 million year example of amber has trapped in it a feather, which is no different to a modern feather. So this idea that feathers could have, could have evolved is actually denied by the evidence that we have, which clearly shows that feathers have always been feathers. Another example of amber is this one, but it's no different to a modern feather. Let me tell you something else about feathers before I leave this first subject of feathers. Have you ever asked the question why owls fly so quietly? Let me tell you something which is utterly stunning about owls. We need to watch a video first. So we'll have the sound up if we may, please, Alistair. And we're going to watch this little clip from the BBC on super-powered owls. Oh, she's... Mo. This is a falcon. The first was a pigeon. And now, now comes the owl. It's Kenza's turn. Shh. 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 silence. No, nothing at all. Absolutely quiet. It's amazing. But what have the microphones picked up? The decibel waveforms show the sound being generated by the birds in flight. Each spike is an individual wing beat. This is the second bird, the falcon. But with the barn owl, there's almost nothing. Yeah. Even our array of super sensitive microphones failed to pick up any sound of Kenza in flight. And here's the owl doing exactly the same. So, what was the secret? Well, the secret is with the comb and the fringe arrangement at the edge of the feathers. So when you next see an owl, and sometimes you can see them in uh, birds of prey sanctuaries, examine the feathers of an owl, and you will notice that they are very, very um, different to these types of feathers because they have a comb on the leading edge. This is not the same owl, but it does demonstrate the point that I'm trying to 
uh, bring to your attention. This is a Tasmanian mast owl. And if we look very closely now, you can see the comb structure. It's like a comb which is at the leading edge of the feather. There is also a trailing edge which looks very messy. If you look at this example, not only have you got the leading edge here, but look at this trailing edge, which is very furry. So it's a combination of both the leading edge and the trailing edge, which causes tiny little uh, twirling bits of air, which we call vortices, to form. Instead of having one great big trailing, what we call a trailing spinning air, trailing vortex, which is what most birds have, owls break that up into tiny, tiny little twirling bits, which are controlled and means that very little motion of the air is actually sensed other than the main flow over the wing, which of course gives lift. But there isn't this extra big turbulence so it's the combination of this leading edge comb and the trailing edge that I mentioned. They are what we call specially quiet feathers. There isn't any evolution of these, I would suggest to you. Owls have always had feathers like that. And indeed, the inspiration for making wind turbines a lot quieter has been picked up by Germans especially in order to reduce the noise of the swish of wind turbines, which some people have found very annoying if they live fairly close to these large machines. And what they do is on the turbine blades, they have a comb near the leading edge, and they have a trailing, um, a trailing serrated fringe on the turbine blades. We, don't, we haven't done it as far as I can see. We haven't got it on our wind turbines. It does cost quite a lot more, of course, to do this, and it is an issue of money. But it just, just shows you that we get inspiration for new ideas from nature. Why? Because God has put in nature some incredible design features particularly for owls. Let me come quickly on to my second point. I've been a long time on that, but I did want to talk about feathers. Flight needs control. If you don't have control, you're going to end up with a real problem. You can't just throw the bits of an aeroplane together and hope for the best. That doesn't work, guys. And the Wright brothers knew about that when they were copying, again, nature, for the basic principle as to how flight occurs. And they realized that you need an aerofoil shape. I don't know whether you realized, but Wilbur and Orville, Orville Wright actually did wind tunnel tests to test the, the wing shape of a wing made of canvas over a wooden structure, which is what they made for their first aircraft. The Smithsonian uh, didn't even do any experiments, not properly testing wind, uh, uh, aerofoil shapes. And no wonder the Smithsonian didn't get the prize. But Wilbur and Orville Wright did. I always find it an irony that in the Smithsonian in Washington, there is the replica of <laughs> Wilbur and Orville Wright's brilliant invention, which is not really to the credit of the, of the Smithsonian. They actually did their job because they carefully understood what was happening with the birds. And flight, of course, developed over the years by understanding control. Now, what they did was to warp their wings with ropes, and they would change the shape. And if they changed the shape of the right wing different to the left wing, then they got a controlled roll, okay? And, of course, instead of having a tail, they put their the equivalent of the vertical surface at the front, sorry, the, 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 not the fin, the, the tail, they actually they put the equivalent of the tail at the front. And you can see it on this picture here. That is the front, and this is the front of their earlier glider that they were using. So uh, 
you need another horizontal surface. They chose to put it at the front. These days, we put it at the back. But rather than changing the camber of our wings by ropes or anything like that, today we use flaps at the back of the wings in order to change the shape, particularly when coming into land or for takeoff. But birds, of course, as the Wright brothers realized, actually change the shape of their wings. And that is a very clever maneuver, and there's a series of muscles which is controlling the feathers. Sometimes, though, the wings are needed to be brought right in, particularly if the birds like these gannets are actually going to do a dive. And my friend Bob Buckley, some years ago, actually did a wonderful series of photographs showing a gannet doing this incredible dive, becoming like a pencil going into the water to get its fish. Flight then needs control. As I've basically been indicating, we use flaps and forward slats in order to control the wings. But what is interesting is that birds also have forward flaps or slats, as well as changing the shape of their wings to act like flaps. And here you can actually see this issue of the forward flaps or the slats in what's called the Alula feathers, which are shown there. And those are very important for actually controlling the lift at low speed. Also, as I indicated with my picture of the white-tailed eagle, here it is on the bull-tailed eagle, birds have winglets. And here's an A320, an Airbus A320, and lots of aircraft that we fly on today have these winglets, which reduce the drag which you always get as a result of lift. So there's always a penalty in producing lift, even... Uh, not just the profile drag, this is drag which you get as a result of the wing producing any lift. Uh, it, there is always a, a penalty, but you can reduce that penalty by actually breaking up this big trailing vortex that you get from any wing. Flight needs control. Remember I talked about irreducible complexity when I talked about hearing it's very true of flight. It, things are irreducibly complex. And if you don't have everything working together, you get problems. As you probably know, some years ago, Boeing got into real difficulty with two major fatal accidents due to a rather uh, quickly produced innovation which didn't work initially on the Boeing 737 MAX. And this was to do with um, an automatic control system in, a, in order to make sure that the aircraft was not going to stall. By uh, pushing the nose up when from a false reading as to the angle of instance of the plane, and that false reading was coming from just one source on, they didn't have two sources, they just had one. And because the angle of attack sensor was re giving an incorrect reading, the pilot was ending up fighting the controls and he didn't quite know what to do on these two accidents. And it, it stalled and went straight into the ground with all the hundreds of people on board. It was two terrible accidents due to Boeing not properly designing their control system. Aircraft always need careful control. Sometimes it doesn't work very well in man-made machines, as I've just been illustrating. And there is a limited window of getting an aircraft to land, which birds beat every time. Compare these two videos. This aircraft doesn't quite get it right. I wouldn't have liked to have been on that Boeing 737 as it landed. The albatross but, with their nesting sites. But here's this albatross coming into land. 
and it has no problem coming into land in the wind. 3,000 pairs of wandering albatross nest on one of them here in South Georgia. Here it is coming into land, no problem, undercarriage down, fairly high wind. It's been on a flight of thousands of miles, comes in beautifully, controls very, very An carefully. An adult wanderer may travel 5,000 miles, sometimes to Brazil and back, in order to collect squid for its young. Wonderful. Slightly down, down on its nose, but all right in the end. Flight needs control. And I've been saying that all these things are needed in order for a bird to work. The Alula feather, as I've already indicated, is like the forward slats. But may I also mention that birds have an anti-stall device, which is shown on this picture, which is a brown skewer, which uh, is showing deliberately the feathers lifting on the upper surface to control the point of separation where the flow leaves the top surface. If it didn't have that control, then the stall would come right forward and it would lose all the lift completely. But it deliberately has feathers which can lift passively as the low pressure is formed over the wing. But it's basically an anti-stall flap. It's really quite remarkable. Birds have these devices to enable them to control their wings. Birds also, some of them, but not all, of course, have the ability to hover. The notable uh, aerobatic experts are, of course, hummingbirds. These hummingbirds are just a wonder to behold. I've seen them in America, as is shown in this coast. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird. It looks black on its throat because I haven't quite got the light reflecting to show it. Here's another picture which does show the ruby-throated hummingbird there. But their flight is utterly marvellous because they have the ability to not only bring their wings down with a downstroke, but also to turn their wings right over and even on the apparent upstroke to bring it down. So they're actually doing a figure of eight motion, which requires, by the way, a special joint at their shoulder, which enables the whole of the, uh, the, the, the humerus bone, as well as they have a radius and an ulna, which is, con which is actually supporting their wing. Their wing really comes from where the equivalent where our elbow is, and they only have a very short humerus bone, which is right up here. Very short humerus bone. So their wing is actually coming from the, the equivalent of our elbow, and the wrist is supporting much larger finger bones, and the wing is operated really from the radius and ulna and through the finger bones, right? And the alula feather that I mentioned earlier is actually connected to the equivalent of the thumb. And it can be from five to seven feathers form those forward flaps that I was referring to. So th there is an amazing construction in the wings of birds. But for, for the hummingbird, the, the humerus bone is able to actually swivel right over and only the hummingbird can do this. It swivels. We can't do it because my humerus bone won't do it. But their, their wings can go right over 180 degrees and a bit beyond. So they can get this figure of eight motion. And they can be beating their wings 50, 60, 70 times per second. And... They can do it slightly differently on the left and the right, which will cause them to move sideways. They, if they change this figure of eight motion such that there's more, more uh, force going on, on one of the uh, swoops downwards than, the, than the, the, the forward one, then they can cause themselves to go backwards. And so you see hummingbirds you know, basically shifting all over the place far faster than the human eye can actually cope with. And it's this swivel joint which is absolutely essential for hummingbirds to do this. So if you get very fast photography, you can actually catch this movement 
of the hummingbird wing. I actually had the joy of going to um, the uh, uh, to one of the West Indies islands and to see the tiny little Antilles crested hummingbird. I was very grateful to get this picture. It's a tiny little hummingbird. It's one of the smallest, not the smallest, but it's a very beautiful little creature. And here it is with its little crest on top, beautiful co colouring. And then there was the green-throated uh, carib, which was also there. Breathtaking beauty in these wonderful creatures. But what is also amazing about hummingbirds is that they have a tongue which is very special. They feed, like bees and other insects and other creatures, very small creatures, on nectar. And nectar is just basically coke, you know, just uh, energy <laughs> straight away, sugar, basically. And you can see here the tongue going into the, uh, into the flower to get the nectar at the bottom. So they need long beaks. And you can actually see in this little video, you can actually see the tongue coming out. Let's just examine that tongue. I'll just show you this video clip of the tongue of a hummingbird. The hummingbird's tongue is about twice as long as its beak, so it can reach deep into a flower. And until recently, many scientists believed that the birds relied heavily on capillary action to draw the nectar through their tongues and into their mouths. It's kind of like water spontaneously rising up a thin straw in a glass. But some fascinating discoveries at the University of Connecticut have shown that the mechanisms involved are much more dynamic than anyone realized. The hummingbird's tongue is actually a nectar trap equipped with a pair of narrow tubes that taper sharply. The tip of each tube is segmented into a row of flaps that are attached to a supporting rod. When the bird isn't eating, these flaps form two rows of closed loops that fit compactly into the beak. But when the hummingbird feeds, its tongue undergoes a dramatic transformation. Inside the flower, the tongue extends to make contact with the nectar. When immersed in fluid, the tip splits and the flaps on each fork systematically unfurl. Then as the tongue is withdrawn, the flaps close tightly to seal and capture the nectar for delivery into the bird's mouth. Where did that come from? That has to be design. And the tongue comes out between seven to 10 times per second, doing that very action that we've just been referring to. It is basically, as this uh, quote says, the findings could affect thinking about how flowers and hummingbirds, this is an evolutionist speaking, have evolved together since the shape of the flower, the composition of the nectar, and the shape and workings of the tongue must all fit together for the system to work. This is interconnected systems by their own admission. This is irreducible complexity. This is no evolution, guys. You can't have it because everything must be working. So the hummingbird tongue is just completely destroys any notion of evolution of the hummingbird tongue, let alone the ability to hover and all the other things. Briefly, let me just consider the bone and muscle structure. Did you know that the bones of birds are essentially hollow, except for diving birds? There are some birds which dive and therefore they need to be slightly heavier. So the bones, although most of us, 
would like to have light bones sometimes, it wouldn't help, would it? Because we're land-based creatures. So birds in the main have light bones. And they have to have strength, so they have to have this Warren's truss arrangement, which is what it's called after a chap called Warren, copied this for aircraft industry, okay? So they have this truss arrangement, which you see on bridges, in order to give strength inside the bird. Exceedingly light, hollow, unlike land based animals. But as I said, some diving birds, like the tufted puffin that I saw in Alaska many years ago, here you can see it trying to take off because it has fairly heavy bones because puffins need to dive in order to get their fish. They're lovely, cute birds, and we all love them. They have wonderful faces. But the, so the birds have to have a structure appropriate to what their conditions are. They manage, puff, puffins manage very well, thank you, in the main. But in, as we then go on to consider the muscle structure, these bones, which I've just referred to, support muscles which, in the main, have their, great, their greatest weight where you would expect for flight. The weight is not on the back, the weight's on the breast. So when you carve next time at Christmas, or I would say to the Americans at your Thanksgiving, you actually put the bird on its, uh, on its back and you're actually carving against the breastbone. Let me tell you what's happening with this breastbone. Because that breastbone has an amazing structure connected to it. We're looking end on at the breastbone, which is the sternum bone. And there are muscles attached to the sternum which are, yes, similar, one of them similar to all other creatures. That is the main pectoralis major muscle, which you used in order to do some work, whatever you were doing, maybe wiping the floor or hitting your pal, <laughs> whatever you were doing, right? That motion, okay? That's the pectoralis major muscle. We have a weak muscle on our backs to lift our humerus bone. It's not a very strong muscle. But a bird has a second, another muscle called the supracoracoideus muscle. It's a bit complicated. Supra means above. So it's a muscle, as you can see, which goes above the coracoid, which is this area. And it actually threads through and uh, through the coracoid and it then enables there to be quite a powerful motion, like a pulley, to actually lift the wing up. You can see this in operation when you see this flight of, uh, of a bird in this little video. You can see there it is, the supracoracoideus muscle lifting the wing. So you have two muscles, one against the other. Please notice next time at Christmas, you're carving the turkey, you, you carve, first of all, against the supra, sorry, the pectoralis major muscle, and then tucked underneath is the supracoracoideus muscle. You can actually see the meat separates at that very point. So remember that next time you carve, you will see it. There are many other things I could say on the bone and muscle arrangement, but I'll just mention one very significant point, and that's this that on the wing of a bird, there is a special tendon called the patagial tendon, which is unique to birds. Remember I said that the humerus is right up here, okay? Then you've got the radius and the ulna, and then you've got the, the, the basically the, 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 the hand of the bird is supporting the outer part of the wing with the, what you would call the fingers, or we would normally call the fingers. So, of course, it, it's difficult to actually show this in, in reality but because the shoulder is tucked much more up here. But in order to control this part of the wing and to, to pull it in, right, you've got to have a tendon, and that's called the patechial tendon, which is peculiar to birds. We could say an awful lot more about the, uh, the aeroelasticity which has been understood in more recent years as a result of 
people carefully examining the anatomy of a bird's wing. There is, if you like, there is, there, there is a rhythm and a motion in the wing which uses energy without wasting it. That's what I mean by the aeroelastic effects, which I won't have time to go into. Let me, though, give a little bit of time to breathing and then, a, lastly, very much at the end, cl uh, a clever system. Birds breathe by an entirely different mechanism to us. We breathe in a sort of uh, inflating balloon lungs, basically, uh, upside down. We, it's a really a tree arrangement of, uh, of uh, air passages which enable the air to actually get down into the bloodstream. So we breathe in, down the trachea, into our lungs, and then we go into uh, bronchial tubes, which get smaller and smaller and subdivide, then right into the blood. That's oxygen. And then we breathe out carbon dioxide in the reverse through all those bronchial tubes until finally we breathe out uh, our air, the carbon dioxide. Not so with birds. Birds have what's called parabronchial tubes. And they have a continuous flow such that, yes, they do breathe in and out, but as the air comes in, it does not immediately go through the lung. It goes to a, a place at the back ready to come through um, these parabronchial system such that if I show you a diagram, it would probably be the best way to understand this. I'm going to give you this diagram. It's probably the best one to help you to understand this. You see here that the bird's air comes through its trachea and it goes to a rear air sac when it breathes in. So we can think of this, right? If you follow my fist, uh, which is representing the air, right? The air is breathed in and it goes to the back, right? So it's breathed in. Now, it's going to breathe out. An earlier packet of air is now going to, I'll come to that in a moment, is going to come out of its trachea, but not this one. Now, this one goes through the lung, right? Which is a series of parallel tubes such that the air goes this way and the blood goes that way. And it's a constant flow. Do you get me? Right? It's not stopping like our lungs have air come to a dead stop. So when it's breathed out, this packet of air now has gone through the lung. Now it breathes in again and another packet of air goes to the back. This one now goes to a forward front air sac, ready for an exhaling... Again, breathing out, this one comes out. So it's a two-stroke breathing or two-part breathing system. So it's constant circulation of air. Isn't that clever? Because that means that the bird doesn't have to, uh, you know, bring everything to a stop. It's very efficient because it's often in sympathy with the beating of its wings as well. And it moves its sternum, by the way, in order to power this system. And it moves its sternum up and down. We can't move our sternum without breaking our breast bones, uh, breaking the rib, rib structure. So in order to actually enable that, it has articulated rib, rib bones or rib uh, structure. Here, here it is. This is the articulated ribs on a bird's skeleton. Did that come about just by accident and mutations from some poor reptile which wasn't able to breathe properly as it was changing its system of breathing? Frankly, it, everything is indicating brilliant engineering has gone into the design of birds. Well, just briefly, some clever systems to end with. Birds, you'll have seen, sometimes fly, as these Canada geese do, in uh, V formation. You remember I mentioned that with every bit of lift, there is a penalty of this trailing vortex. Well, some clever birds, 
they think, oh, well, that, that guy's flying there. I'm going to, as this bird's flying, right, he's going that way, and the, the trailing vortex is doing this. It's got a little bit going up, so he cleverly puts his wing over that bit, so he gets a bit of help for him. And, of course, as he's flying away, right, with this bird flying up, flag ahead who's doing most of the work he gets he ha doesn't have to work so much and then another bird does the same to him until you've got a nice line of diagonal birds flying sometimes you see them flying in a sort of diagonal and then the, 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 another another bird comes along and says oh i can get it on the left as well and so then they form a v-shaped and the poor chap at the front is doing most of the work well if they're going a long distance and sometimes they are the one at the back begins to change place, if you notice, with the one at the front. So the poor chap at the front no longer is doing most of the work. And overall, over a long journey, they'll, do le they'll have less work to do. Sometimes uh, turns will do that, um, although it's usually other birds, which, like plovers, which I'll show you in a minute, who do it. The Arctic tern flies a massive distance on its migration, it flies 12,000 miles. That's just a, an incredible journey where they are making huge flights. Now, they do stop on the way. It's not non-stop. Uh, but it is quite remarkable, some of the journeys that birds make. If you come in November to the uh, mega conference, I'm going to do a whole talk on migration. There's much more to it. But I will just mention a little tidbit from my talk on migration, which is the Pacific Golden Plover. This is the bird which actually does do the V formation in order to save, be, save its energy. Because did you know that the Pacific Golden Plover migrates nonstop to Hawaii, a distance of 3,000 miles across open ocean? The adults go first. And did you know that the young ones who've never been before make the journey on their own. They have to know how much to feed on, because if they feed too much, they'll become too heavy. If they don't feed enough, they won't be able to make the distance to Hawaii. There's absolutely staggering flights going on, and they, they're doing it all the time. I think God has put into us, into, sorry, into his creatures, the things that he's made, amazing design features. The bird which actually takes the biscuit for flying the furthest is the bar-tailed godwit, which flies across the Pacific Ocean, which you saw from what Simon showed earlier. You know, it's a gigantic ocean. It's absolutely huge. I've flown across it, and it really takes hours on hours, you know, flying at, of course, 600 miles an hour. These birds don't fly anywhere near that. They cr fly across open ocean, taking nearly a week to go from Alaska to New Zealand. You can hear more about that if you come in October or early November. Let me just end on scripture. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and stretch her wings towards the south, Job? You know full well that Job is being spoken to here by God himself. And God refers to the amazing things that he has made. He also says in the same book, Job, have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like him? You deck yourself now with majesty and excellency, and you array yourself with glory and beauty. You can't. God has done that. I could say more about the way colors are produced on feathers. But suffice for me to say that God made flying creatures on which day? You can see on the screen. It's not at the same time as he made land creatures. In fact, it's before land creatures. God has done that, I believe, deliberately to give the lie to the idea that land creatures led to flying creatures. No, he made them deliberately on the fifth day and then he made the land creatures. God has a wisdom far greater than anybody else. And he is to be praised. The invisible things of God, 
him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that men, they, are without excuse. May God be praised, and to him be the glory. Amen. I think Neil's going to say something about books. Over to you, Neil. There's a few minutes to break after this. Thank you, Andy. Is this on? Grand. Right. Um, just thought I'd spotlight a few bits and pieces because you've been so good in absorbing so much. How can you expect to withhold that, right? If you can, please tell me. I want to know. Um, in the meantime, my method is to get stuff to help you remember. And I just, because you've been with us throughout, and please be with us for one last thing, which will be much more practical about getting the information out there. A uh, few things to let you know about. Andy mentioned it. Obviously, it's different when an author mentions their own resources and then someone else can plug it to the hilt. The Wonders of Creation. That is the best coffee table book we have ever had. All right. And it has got sections on hummingbirds. All right. It has got sections, as someone was talking to me about earlier, on uh, radioactive dating as well. OK. And that is five pounds off when we're on tour. It's 25 pounds if you buy it off the website. It's 20 pounds if you buy it uh, on tour. In addition to that, what we realized is that the back of this, it's got the gospel. It explains why um, uh, we were discussing in the break, why bad things happen to good people, what happened to the world, etc., etc. That's in the back of here. Right, but this is a big thing. It's quite an investment. You don't want to give it away. So what you do is you leave it lying around in your house with a nice page open, right? Take their order for coffee. Go and get their coffee. Watch them perusing this lovely book. And then what you do is you send them away with a free copy of this little one. And the way we will honour that is that if you get this for not £25 but £20, just as a token gesture, we will give you one of those for free if you are willing to give it away. So you buy that, get that one free, all right? And also, this has been used in prison ministry, okay? Because this is a weapon in a prison, this not so much. The words are more important in this than anything solid in this. Okay, so those things are there. Crucial information, very positive. Staying on the theme of birds, there's a little booklet here for a pound. This is an exclusive. This isn't even available anywhere else. Uh, Colin Mitchell, who is based down in Bournemouth and is a friend uh, of Andy, uh, he's taken his, he's a keen ornithologist. He's taken his own photographs, uh, in this instance, of a turtle dove. And he's done an evangelistic article to go with it, which is on our web website. But have you noticed when you say, oh, by the way, go on a website and find that out, how many people actually do? Because if you actually give them something, then that's better. And that's just the pound. Okay. Also, some of you might not have been aware, there's a big spinner rack out there. Uh, DVDs, all right, they're seven pounds each. But we've got a special deal, which I'll explain. So here you go. Intricacies of flight. See the forerunner to the talk that you've had this evening. An earlier version, Intricacies of Flight, by Professor Mac uh, Macintosh, £7. There's one here more recently, The Extraordinary Bombardier Beetle, by Professor Macintosh, for which he has won national awards, £7. Or any three DVDs on the spinner rack for £10. Makes sense, right? If you don't want three and you just want one and you want to maybe give it to someone or equip yourselves, how about this one? Skeptical look at atheism, science without God, question mark, by Professor McIntosh, too clear at just two pounds. All right, you've got that. Finally, was that me to shut up? Anyway, finally, we have, hang on, wow, edit that. Um, we have God's Big Book of Animals, all right? If you're anything like what I was as a kid, I loved books on animals. But the problem is that you give those books to children, and usually the beginning is all about, you know, evolution, this, that, and the other. With this, great big pictures, 
Um, on animals, and try and find you a bird. Here you go, swans. Right, duck kind created on day five. You know that your children, your grandchildren, your next door neighbour's children, whatever, will look at this and will not get fed a lie. They'll get fed the truth. If I could ever go back in time, this is the kind of book I would love to give myself. Who could it be useful for as far as you're concerned? Equip yourselves, make use of it, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes.
And we need to recognize that in order to reach a society which is so, not just post-Christian, but what you're going to see, it's post-modern. It doesn't believe in any absolutes. Um, please, can I just remind you as to our Truth in Science conference as people are walking in. Uh, that's what we did last year with uh, two days of intense teaching, not only on the science, but on the issues of how do you resist atheism in the humanities, how do you resist the woke movement, how do you resist LGBT stuff, which is coming big time into our universities and the woke movement. We have special talks on the woke movement. And it was just a wonderful thrill to be with young people, training them. And we would encourage you, if you can, send some of your young people down to be with us. Just go to the Truth in Science website, and it's £90 for two days. Back in 2017, it was 500 years since the Reformation. So let me just give you a little, quick little rundown on some of the things which were so significant in the Reformation. Um, 1517 is usually the year that we, we uh, remember as the important day because Luther put his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg and that's what people tend to celebrate. But actually many other people before him were working uh, to and being used of God. William Tyndale is one of the most notable he translated the Bible directly from Hebrew to English, and he was persecuted by Henry VIII, ended up strangled and burnt at the stake uh, at a place not far from Brussels. He said to a priest on one occasion, if God spare my life here many years, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And at his death, just before he was strangled, he said, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. We might well pray that today concerning our king. I think the queen, his mother, knew an awful lot more on these matters and respected the gospel. Whether she was fully understanding the gospel, I'm not going to make a comment. But she certainly had a tremendous respect for the gospel. And she was a regular attender to where the gospel was preached. Martin Luther opposed Roman Catholic Church uh, uh, overindulgences, I put there, because I don't mean he was overindulgent, what I'm really saying, that he opposed the Roman Catholic Church over the indulgences. So I'm sorry if that doesn't read very well. What are indulgences or what were they? It was buying a reduction of time in so-called purgatory, which it was meant to be a half place between heaven and hell. Uh, or, you know, a temporary place, as it were. And, of course, it's wrong. Indulgencies, buying a reduction of time in purgatory, is just a nonsense. He rightly stood against that. Because what? The gospel was at stake, okay? So in his day, he was standing firm on the gospel. You probably realise, some of you, if you've visited Oxford, that there is a spot in Oxford. I don't know whether you've ever recognised it, but it's in Broad Street. And if you've been to Oxford, it's... and if, Sorry, if you haven't yet been to Oxford, it's a long way from here, of course. It's well worth a visit because people cycle over this and they just don't realise the significance of it. The students don't realise it. Round the corner gives you a clue because there's a memorial... And the memorial, rightly there, is because of a great event which took place in October the 16th, 1555. At that spot in Broad Street, two men died. Their names were Latimer and Ridley, and they were burnt at the stake on that very cross. Latimer said to Ridley, the younger man, he said, Be of good comfort and play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day... I'm always moved when I read this because it frankly is just an incredible prayer as they died. 
Master Ridley, we shall this day light such a candle that by God's grace in England, as I, well, he put it, by God's grace in England, as I trust, shall never be put out. That's England. You've had similar cases in Scotland. I could talk to you about the Wigtown martyrs in the days when the Covenanters and others were dying for the faith. And these two ladies, the older Margaret and uh, Mary, if I remember rightly. Mary, I think, was the older, and Margaret, I may have got it round the wrong way. But the older lady said to the younger lady to stand firm for Christ. The older lady died first as the tide came in. And then the younger lady refused to give way and said that Christ is king. That was in the days of the Covenanters. Martin Luther, as I've just said, stood against the terrible things of Roman Catholicism. Primarily, it was concerning, therefore, how a person is saved with the ladies that I've just referred to in the Wigtown Martyrs. It was to do with the authority of Christ over the church. But basically, it's all part of the issue of the Reformation in both England and Scotland. Not only was it over the gospel, but it was concerning also the ability of minds to think freely on science. Let me wind the clock right back, because I need to just show you something. So that was the Reformation. Let me, let's go way back to the Greeks. Did you know that the Greeks had a sort of strange philosophy which uh, was a forerunner, as you will see in a moment, of evolution? Socrates rightly is respected, and so is Plato and Aristotle. I'm not completely dishing all that they taught, although they weren't in any way lovers of truth in terms of the Bible. They were not actually showing a respect to the things that God had revealed in those days in the Old Testament. They had some knowledge. Some of it was good, but not all of it. Socrates talked about how do we know anything? How, where does critical thought come from? How do we know logic? How do we know ethics? And he would say that reasoning is the servant of virtue. Many regarded Socrates as the beginning of democracy. Plato was a student of so Socrates. He talked about dualism, which is not totally wrong, but it, it's not Neither is it totally right. You get into real trouble if you follow entirely what Plato was teaching. He did believe in a sort of immortality. Again, he talked about reason and logic. Truth, goodness, beauty are the main theme of his book, Dialogues. Then you come to Aristotle, who was, if you like, a grandson of Socrates in, in terms of the teaching. He was a student of Plato. His emphasis was on reason and logic, and giving a basis to the scientific understanding of the world. And what did he teach? Well, this is where it touches on evolutionary thinking. And I want you to see that there is an important for forerunner, really, and there is a connection with Darwin, which I'll, I'll bring out in a moment. He taught about the four basic elements of fire, water, air, and earth, and that there is a great chain of being that you have the lower plants, the higher plants, the jellyfish, the insects, the fish, the reptiles, the birds, mammals and humans. They even split up humans and will put man right at the top and poor woman was beneath him. So we actually have failures going on in our own understanding of science today because we are driven... Amazingly, you'll see from that great chain of being, it's actually linked with evolution. And I just want you to see what's going on. In our present system, it fails properly to teach in our own education, um, the secular education in our countries, both in Scotland and in England and in Wales and Northern Ireland even. It fails to teach the history of science, that the very scientific method 
grew out actually of a Christian worldview. And this Christian worldview challenged what I've just shown you, the Aristotelian system, and I'll show you in a moment. And of course, it fails to teach design. So what really was happening with the reformers, and it, this is a quote from a book which is not very well known, or an article, I should say, which is not very well known, but I'm going to quote it anyway. And if you want an in-depth book, there is a fairly good book. It's Again, it's not, I'm not going to say that everything in it is right, but it's useful because it does recognise that the Bible and Protestantism was very significant in the rise of science in our in our Western world. So that's the book which is there mentioned by Peter Harrison. But this quote is from a chap called Deason, who's not so well known. But he says this, that the acceptance, I'm just reading the bit in red, that the acceptance of science in Protestant countries rested in part on the perceived similarity between inductive study of scripture, right, testing it out, and the inductive study, again testing it out, of nature, both in opposition to the Aristotelian way of doing things, which was basically deducing something without doing any experiments. So this then bypassed, as he says here, the corruptions introduced by the Greeks, the Greek philosophies that I've just been referred to, especially Aristotle. So the scientific method, what is it? Which, and it was this which overthrew the Aristotelian thinking. Basically, if you start at the top, you observe something. This is the scientific method. You research on that area, find out what others have done, and you take your observations and you suggest a hypothesis as to how something is working. Then you test that hypothesis with an experiment. And then you analyze the data of that experiment, and that data either confirms your hypothesis, or else you have to change your hypothesis, and so you would then perhaps have a question at the top instead of an observation, and you then change your hypothesis. And you basically, you go around that loop. That's what modern research does. So let me just say that the first point that I've been making is that the education system in our countries fails to teach the true history of science. Let me show you some of the scientists, including a Russian on the right, who was a polymath, Lomonosov. He was actually a brilliant uh, Russian scientist. All these, Newton, Boyle, Michael Faraday, your own James Clark Maxwell, who came from uh, Scotland, Edinburgh, and Johann Kepler, Lord Kelvin, Louis Pasteur, all these came as a result, or their thinking came as a result of the Reformation. Let me just show you what was believed in astronomy for many years. Peter Alpion's Cosmographia, published in 1524, shows the typical medieval view of cosmology based on Ptolemy, one of the Greeks, which basically said that the stars go round literally in a sort of a, a solid dome, which was what he was basically saying was going on with the Earth at the centre, including the Sun. And so people ended up, before Copernicus, with this idea of the Earth being at the centre and all the planets doing very odd movements. Jupiter, if you watch it night by night, uh, for a while it's going in the right direction and then it appears to go in the opposite direction. And in order to explain that, you have to put in epicycles on your cycles of the planets going round, apparently going round the Earth. And of course, they're not going round the Earth. They're really going round the Sun, including ours. And at times, one planet will overtake another, which is why you get this backwards movement. 
and indeed we overtake others. So you get, from our perspective, the planets looking as though they're going backwards. Everything, therefore, was in a geocentric, locked into a geocentric way of thinking, because Aristotle had taught that, or at least Ptolemy had. Copernicus, of course, put an end to that by suggesting that actually that the orbit of the planets was not centred on the Earth, but it was centred really, naturally, on the Sun. And of course, that explains all sorts of things, including, by the way, the wonderful eclipse that I saw last week. I happened to be in Virginia, and I saw the eclipse. It wasn't total where I was, and indeed, it was cloud covered just at the wrong moment. I was really a bit frustrated. But I took pictures with my camera, which had a special solar filter on it, so I could take these pictures. As you can see from left to right, I went, uh, this is where it was just beginning, at uh, 2.15 or wherever it was in Virginia. Then it gradually moved over. Oh, it was wonderful. And uh, then... The clouds came just at the wrong moment, so I took it through the clouds without the filter. And you could see this is not looks like the moon, but it's actually the sun and the moon almost covering 85% maximum. And then it moved off and uh, the clouds moved. So <laughs> obviously we understand everything far better by understanding that our moon revolves around the earth. That moon, of course, sometimes gets in the way of the sun, and incredibly, it's 400 times smaller than the sun, but also 400 times closer than the sun. So we have this incredible system, which is virtually unique, it is unique, to our planet, such that people standing on Earth can see this effect. You couldn't stand on any other planet, apart from the fact you couldn't breathe, which is a minor point, but you wouldn't be able to, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see this effect, except here. So science, including astronomy, which I've just been emphasizing there, uh, flourished as a result of what? The Reformation. Because the Reformation overthrew the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, and this is the point, which was in cahoots with Aristotelian thinking. Do you get it? So the Roman Catholic Church was locked into an authority structure which had begun in the sciences, especially with Aristotle, which had led to all the idea, well, you've got to believe it because the authority says it. And of course, you can see that how that fits in with papal authority. You've got to believe it because the Pope believes it or says it, ex cathedra. So everybody's got to bow down to the idol of the papacy. But basically what happened was that the science challenged that. And of course, in John 8, verse 36, you've got this wonderful scripture. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And it applies right across not only theology, which of course is where it primarily, excuse me, primarily applies, but it applies in all the natural sciences and all our universities were to the glory of God at this time. The setting up of Cambridge, the setting up of Oxford, the setting up of Edinburgh up here and uh, your own Glasgow University, which was obviously later, but nevertheless, all these universities were all set up to the glory of God and that everything flowed out of the... The, the wonder of the Reformation right across Europe and especially here and especially in Germany and in the Western parts of our uh, Western Europe. So people like Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, they were respectful. Isaac Newton was not a true Christian because he didn't believe in the Trinity as far as we can understand. Robert Boyle, it does seem, really was a believer but I wouldn't put Isaac Newton in there, but he certainly had respect for the Bible, right? And not all, of course, were Christians, but there was a great understanding as to the importance of being free at last to do your own experiments and to test things. So the Royal Society uh, was set up in 
This is now 100 and, well, what about 150 years later. You're in the late 1600s, and the Royal Society uh, was set up by, um, by uh, uh, in, in the time of um, King Charles II. It's one of the only few things that King Charles II did right. He did an awful lot of damage, frankly, but because he was uh, pretty immoral. Uh, but under him, the Royal Society was set up. And that was a good thing. The founding of the Royal Society in 1660 by a group of scientists and philosophers uh, is, is there. And the motto of the Royal Society is, and still is, nullius in verba, on the word, roughly translated from the Latin, it means on the word of no one. I'm going to do my own experiments. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say this is true simply because such and such down the road has says it. No, I'm going to test it for myself. And in many ways, that was a very good position to take. I wish the Royal Society would act on its own motto today. And sadly, it doesn't. It basically takes the line that, you know, unless you bow to the idol of evolution, you won't get anything published in the, in certainly in the biological sciences in Proceedings of the Royal Society Series B. I have something published in Series A, which is on the physical sciences. But let me now just move on, because Reformation led to the Renaissance, which is when the sciences flourished, the arts flourished, architecture flourished right across Europe. America didn't know anything about this because they hadn't even really got there yet. You know, they had to have their revolution <laughs> from, from us. <laughs> but that's another story of what happened in America. But in those, in those times, that's why the Americans love coming over here and looking at all the wonderful things and say, oh, you know, that's anything, anything over 100 years they go gawp at. But uh, something 500 years old, wow, that really is something. And of course, we do have things like that, 500 years old. And wonderful architecture, just incredible. Uh, King's College in Cambridge, absolutely awesome, majestic buildings. All, all going back to those sorts of times, Henry VIII and following. Then you come to the Enlightenment. Ah. I don't like the word enlightenment. It's the endarkment. So I call it that. This is the time that things went wrong. I've just told you that the Royal Society is all part of the Renaissance, really. But the endarkment is times of things like the French Revolution, man-centered thinking, and it's a reversal. It's a reversal to the Greek way of thinking. It's the time of a belief back into this idea of the ladder of life that I mentioned earlier. This is the rise of atheism. This is the rise of uh, what we heard earlier of Darwin. We've, we were hearing of... Um, oh, his name's gone from me. Uh, but the... What the Lyle, yeah, Charles Lyle, and of course uh, of uh, the, the, the other Scotsman. What was his name? Hutton, that's right, James Hutton. Sorry, my mind went to blank. But before them, before them, was Linnaeus, right? Now, Carol, Carolus Linnaeus, I'm not going to say whether he believed in the gospel, that's not what I'm trying to show just at the moment. But he was still in the spirit of the previous Renaissance by simply saying, let's categorize all the animals and all the plants. And a lot of the Linnean system is still used today. It's not, not, not particularly wrong because it's, you might just call it glorified stamp collecting, but it's not. To be fair, uh, to the <laughs> you do need to classify things. And he classified things well. And he did put in the idea of long periods of time of evolution that Lyell and Hutton and others brought in and, of course, Darwin. Now... In this, very shortly after this time, comes along the grandfather of Charles Darwin. 
Now, interesting what he did. He wrote in his book, Zoonomia, the following. And it's important to just see these things developing. And it was in the in Enlightenment, really the Endarkament, I would call this. Would it be too bold, he writes, to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament with the great first cause, endued with animality and all the rest of it? In other words, what's he doing? Going back to the Greeks. That's what he was doing. He was... So... When Charles Darwin comes along, was he really doing something new? Not really. He was actually reverting back to the philosophy of Aristotle. And that's the way to understand what's happened. People idolised Charles Darwin in the Natural History Museum. Out goes Sir Richard Owen, who was actually the real founder. Uh, and in goes the statue of Charles Darwin. And of course, it's, it's really idolizing a one man, but he wasn't really doing something new. There was Wallace as well at the same time. There was actually quite a lot of battle going on between Darwin and Wallace, because, but neither of them were really being novel. It was actually going back to the Greek philosophy of his grandfather, who himself was going back to Aristotle. Charles Darwin, as we heard earlier, was reading Charles Lyell's Principle of Geology while he was on the Beagle. And that, of course, was also rooted in long ages of time, as I've been saying. So the chain of being of the Greeks. So we need to understand that the millions of years is actually rooted in Greek philosophy. It's not really new. And we need to understand what was going on in, which was leading to the vital changes which accompanied this rise of evolution because it was the endarkament, as I've called it. Okay, the proper name is the Enlightenment, but I don't like the name Enlightenment. So they were basically saying that the possibility of supernaturalism must be resisted. It was denied. And of course, today in re more recent years, we have this quote, it's quite some time ago now, but Richard Levantin says, materialism is an absolute, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And this, of course, is a religious statement. So this approach to science actually uprooted the scientific method that I showed you earlier, which is the proper way to do science, right? So this approach says you cannot have a supernatural creator. It's denied, as Simon was saying earlier. The Big Bang has got to be worshipped. You've got to worship this idea of an evolutionary timescale and all the rest of it. So that became the new religion, and it began, of course, in the properly took off in the 1800s, but I want you to see that it was really flowing out of the so-called enlightenment, what I call the endarkment. And of course, the millions of years was then brought in with this idea of death being there from millions of years before. But of course, that does not produce new creatures, as, which is what we've been trying to say in our talks. Let me just say... One other point, and I do want to bring it to some practical points, and that's this, that all worldviews have a message. They all have a message. If you're thinking of um, communism, they will say, well, we all were created ourselves. Psalm 100 actually says that we did not make ourselves, but of course they deny that. They say, no, we did make ourselves. And the fall in their thinking is private ownership. You've got to throw that overboard and have a revolution. That's what communism says. Rousseau, which was the real beginnings of the French Revolution, he was the philosopher behind it, is we in, we're just individuals. 
We don't need society. We don't need civilization. We're not going to have these relationships. We're going to... Yes, it led to revolution, but it was basically not so much a communist revolution. It was basically overthrowing any thought of authority and individualism wins. Das Kapital was the book for, uh, for uh, communism, of course, and the French Revolution of 1789 is rooted in Rousseau's thinking. They are basically religions of death, and they led, particularly with the two that I've mentioned, communism and the French Revolution, led to the rise of atheism, sorry, the rise of atheism and repression. Now, let me just bring out one last thought before I do move into a practical area. There is an adapted Marxism today in the woke movement, and I think you need to be aware of this. You remember I mentioned communism? Now let's look at the 21st century. Again, it's a self-creation. -cre what is the fall in their thinking? The woke people who come in saying, you know, you need, you need to revise history to be white and to be, uh, to be European, white, male, that's probably the worst thing that you could possibly be. You know, you're the cause of all, or I'm the cause of all the trouble. So the colonial domination was terrible. Race and creeds are wrong. And so revisionism uh, has, is in their creed. Basically, truth is what even a minority, whatever it is, which is repressed, feels. So, of course, it leads to total chaos. And the whole idea is to create chaos because they want to overthrow what is what, in their view, is all to do with colonial domination. Obviously, some of the things were wrong. We're not justifying everything. But can I just show you now in the art, there is a brokenness of society actually pictured in some of these uh, artists from the early, well, sort of mid-20th century. If you look at Escher's pictures, they are clever, but they are actually describing a sort of, well, where do you start? As this picture is, when you look at it carefully, you think, well, the stairs are going one way and then they're going another way, and then it looks like everything's sideways on, and then you think, where's up? Where's down? It's, and I think, actually, the artists are getting at something. I don't particularly like Picasso, but Picasso's crying woman is clearly saying something, and it's actually sort of grasping and saying, how on earth can, can this woman have any sense of meaning in a broken, lost world? That's what Picasso is expressing there. A book which I would recommend to you is Total Truth by Nancy Piercy. It's actually very clever, very clever, very helpful, because she brings out that basically what's happened in our modern thinking is that we've divided the world into two stories, the private and the public. The private has some values, but you keep them to yourself. They're non-rational. You can't verify them. This is what the world is saying. The public is facts, and it's rational, and it's verifiable, and there is no truth. That's what really has happened in a postmodern world, and the postmodernism has fed into the woke movement, which has only come in the last five, six years, really mushroomed during COVID. Interesting comment from Melanie Phillips. She refers to the collapse of morality in the Western world. And she refers in this quote to radical subjectivity. She's a Jewess. She's not a believer, as far as I know, although she was interviewed in a very interesting interview, well worth watching, by Alistair Begg, great preacher in Ohio, I think. Yes, Ohio. Um, Scotsman, of course. Good man. But he's been exported to America. And he's a very good preacher. And he interviews Melanie Phillips, and it's very interesting. It's well worth watching. 
And look, this is what it leads to. Look at the second paragraph. Feelings trump facts every time. No one's lifestyle is to be considered wrong or inferior to anyone else's. No judgment is to be permitted except for the judgment that judgmentalism is wrong. What is right for me is what is right. What I declare something to be is what it is. I feel, therefore I am. She's criticising our society, okay? She's on our side in this issue. She's recognising that it's just total nonsense. You can't do this. So she's really showing that people are saying, I feel, therefore I am. If I feel <laughs> hatred from you, you're wrong to have those views. And of course, that's what's happening today. You get had up for hate speech simply because you're preaching the gospel. Oh, you must be hating people because you're saying they're wrong. And of course, that, that is nonsense. Free speech goes out of the window. And that's what's happening to our country. We have slaughtered babies to, by the million. And the Lord is actually bringing back upon us we are, what we sowed we're now reaping in a total nonsense world where truth cannot be worked out and identity has gone out of the window. Who am I? If you really want to read something which is horrific, look at this quote. This is from a German person who's a director of a, whatever philosophy at uh, University of Mainz. The first thing to understand, I believe, is that there is no such thing as self. No, no thing like the self. Nobody ever had or was a self. Selves are not part of reality. Selves are not something that endures over time. The first person pronoun, I, doesn't refer to an object like a football or a bicycle. It just points to the speaker of the current sentence. Oof, wow. This is going way extreme. There is no thing in the brain or outside in the world which is us. We are processes. The self is not a thing, but a process. Wow. Do you see where these things are going? This is nonsense. But once you've removed God from your thinking, you've lost all identity of what self is. You've lost the definition of humanity. So how then do you reach a broken world? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 says, casting down, I'll just read the second verse, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We need Christians who understand where we're at. So don't despise all academics. They're not all totally out of the window, right? Although you can say, well, I just need my Bible and I just need to witness to people. That's not wrong. But it's a good idea to understand where society is at. That's what I'm saying. It's not a bad thing to understand where these other philosophies are coming from. So... We should recognise what's in the culture, which I've gone through already, so I'm not going to repeat that first point. But what I would say to you is, one of the best ways in is to actually come to the issue of death and suffering. Maybe I will just show you this, which will also make you smile. I'll just give you one other example of Escher, right? You remember I mentioned Escher? Let me show you this. Here's another one where really you can't work out why on earth you seem to have got a perpetual motion machine of water flowing round and coming back again. And uh, you, you just can't work it out. Escher loved to do that, right? And it was basically, he was commenting on society. Society has lost its reference points. That's what he was, I think, doing. This is a very interesting, this will make you smile as well. This is a, this is a cartoon. Three people really admiring modern art, right? <laughs> One person comes in and says, insightful. The next person says, oh, this is compelling. The next person says, exemplary. In comes the cleaner. And the cleaner says, hmm, huh, upside down. <laughs> so you see, <laughs> even she 
<laughs> How on earth does she know what, what one's weighs up or down? You don't. Because modern society has lost its reference point. Just like I said about Picasso, he was recognising that in a much more serious way. And can I just really make you think? I did say that Schaefer said this, if man is not made in the image of God, nothing then stands in the way of humanity. He was pretty prophetic in his day. He was, he was a great thinker in the 70s. And when I was, I'd become a Christian, I read a lot of his books. Escape from Reason is probably, in my view, his best book of all. Because he basically says, you've lost the whole of rationality. And if you want to know more, read my little booklet, uh, Are You Really an Atheist? Because that's the line that I'm taking there, that you've lost all definition of what it is to even understand what rationality is. You've lost humanity, as Schaeffer says. But this is the horrific picture, not by the Francis Bacon uh, of the, 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 the Francis Bacon back in the 1600s, this is another Francis Bacon from Ireland. Not a good man, but he did this painting and he put against it. Man now realises that he is an accident, that he is a completely futile being. And it's just called Head Six. It's horrible. But it just shows the loss of identity, the loss of humanity. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And that was very wise comments from John Adams. America today is in an utter mess because they have left God out of their thinking. Whatever you think about the early fathers of the American uh, Republic, and I'm not joking here, many of them were God-fearing men at the very least. Some of them were real Christians. But he was wise when he said that. It'll only work when you've got a sense of morality from in God we trust. Look on the American dollars where it says that. So we know that actually in order to reach people, You've got to actually ask some vital questions. And the vital question to ask is, where do you put death and suffering? And it's a very, very important point. How do you understand the issue of death and suffering? Why is there a suffering world? So I'm, I'm thinking of this question of death and suffering. If you don't mind, I'm not going to repeat uh, the first title, which is basically what I've done in quite a lot of introduction there. But I want to be practical. I would suggest that when you're dealing with people, a good idea is to go in on the issue of suffering because virtually everybody, either themselves has suffered or knows others in their family which are suffering, right? Right? you'll probably hit them pretty, not, not deliberately hit them, but you know what I would say. You, you'll actually, you'll find that there is a resonance in them if you start referring to suffering. Say, so why, why is the world the way it is? Why is it, why is it that there's so much suffering? And you might just simply say, well, maybe you've suffered or you know somebody who's suffered. And then you need to ask the question, or anticipate the question, where is a good God in a suffering world? In fact, one of you raised this with us privately. A world full of violence, which is very obvious, and the wars going on in Ukraine and in the Middle East, and a very evil world. And may I then, if it's me speaking to somebody like that, may I suggest an answer? that the world, according to the Bible, I don't think we should be afraid to use the Bible because the Bible does refer to suffering. The world was not made 
like it is now. Did you know that, friend? They will say, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, the world had a dramatic change. So suffering is only really understood when we put Genesis 3 into the perspective. When we actually put Genesis 3 in, it actually begins to make sense of the suffering that we all experience. To make the bridge, it might be most helpful to give a personal testimony of how maybe through prayer and God's presence with you, that you have known strength in the midst of suffering. Juliet and I have known our measure of suffering. Not that we've anywhere near suffered like some have suffered, but uh, we went through an experience of our fourth, uh, 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 sorry, uh, our, our, um, yeah, our fourth son, uh, no, I get it right, the third son, um, we had Philip and David, and then we had Stephen. And Stephen died suddenly, overnight, just went. And that was obviously a deep time of difficulty and trial where we couldn't understand it. But sometimes when we've shared that with individuals, we found they resonate because they know either of somebody else or else they've had some experience similar themselves. And I think it's good to make yourself a little bit vulnerable on that and just to share it. Sometimes I've said, in more recent years, three years ago, I had a heart attack and I was on my way out. And then the, the uh, doctors tried to get me back again. They put stents into my heart, very similar to Nagy, but it was a different part that went wrong. He had a major, uh, what was it, a three, what do you call it, a triple bypass operation. I didn't have that. I had stents put in, but they had to get my heart going again. And they tried once, twice, three times, four, five, six times, couldn't, didn't work, and then the seventh time it did work. So that's why I'm here. I can say that to people. So, you know, I should have gone, but I didn't. Uh, so, yeah, it took me a while to recover with the kindness of my wife and uh, the goodness of God on us. So speak of something which maybe you've known personally. Then say, why do we suffer? Evolution says, we've always had it. Just got to get used to it. I this is life. That's not much help to a lady who's just losing their child of leukemia. You're back in the stage of that Picasso woman, you know, desperately crying and not seeing any sense in a broken world. But the Bible makes sense because it says that death and suffering comes as a result of sin. And you can lead into the gospel and when it comes to suffering and all the disease and death that we've talked about, the, the real picture is of the fall and then, of course, the flood, which explains a lot of the death of the fossils and all the rest of it. And that the original world was good, good, all good. And that everything was perfect. And, of course, everything went wrong as a result of man's sin. Adam brought sin and the second Adam brings life which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So do you see that suffering is a way in to speak to people? The gospel needs to be brought back in on the basis of Genesis. And referring to Genesis is a very practical way in. Let me now deal with one other point, which I had there, as you probably saw in my in my, in my reasoning, that authority and true history is also a way in to understand how we deal with a, a culture which is so against the gospel, 
reconnecting the gospel to a godless culture must involve stating where true authority comes from. Evolution is basically an idol. And as I've indicated, Greek culture is very much connected with an evolutionary mindset. They didn't call it evolution in, in the days of Aristotle. They called it the chain of being. Now we've got to actually put a creation base to understand a totally different way of thinking. Now, the person whom you're speaking to may challenge you on all sorts of evidences to do with evolution and to do with, you might well wish to take some of those arguments on, but I would suggest to you that practically you've got to turn to the scriptures at some point because you don't want to be endlessly arguing forever on the issue of evidences. You really want to get to their presupposition. This is why I like Francis Schaeffer, because Francis Schaeffer talked about using a pincer movement. He would use evidences on some cases, but if he could, he would use a presuppositional argument. How does the presuppositional argument say? Well, look, let me, somebody got a Bible. I haven't left, I've left my Bible. Uh, can I just borrow yours? Yeah, thank you. No, no, I meant a, a page Bible. Okay, I'll get mine, which is here, sitting here. doesn't matter. So you have your Bible in your hand, right? And the Bible, you refer to it unashamedly. It's a good idea to have a paper Bible, by the way, in witness, just a small Bible, just to refer to it. And say... I am referring to the Bible, and I'm quite unashamed to do so. But you want to actually challenge their presupposition. So you may use evidences to a certain extent, but say, but how do you know that evolution is true? And you push them a little bit on how do you know? How do you, how do you know anything? How do you know that your mind isn't deceiving you? And you can, they might then say, well, how do you know? I say, well, I know on the authority of the Bible. You might then have some trouble using the argument. You may have to talk about manuscript evidence to verify authenticity of the Bible. I haven't time. It would be a whole other talk to talk about the authenticity of the New Testament. But with the thousands of manuscripts we have, we actually know that we've got what the people said. Then you've got the issue as to whether it's true or not. And one of the basic witnesses you should never forget is the fact that Jesus Christ not only died, which is easily documented because there are people outside the Bible, like Tacitus and Pliny, uh, Pliny and, of course, Josephus, which clearly show that Jesus Christ died. But the big argument is the resurrection. Because the resurrection of Christ, you've got an empty tomb and there's no answer to that empty tomb. Because it would have been easy for the Romans or the Jews who hated the Lord Jesus Christ to have just simply rolled on the dead body of Christ and said, that's, that's your Christianity. This man is dead and done for. But they couldn't do it. So there's a number of lines you can follow. But what I'm really trying to get the person to consider is your presupposition. You haven't got a presupposition which is consistent with your own logic, as was brought out by Simon earlier. How does the atheist even know that rationality is true? He was mentioning that. So what we can show is the, the consistency of our position and the fact that it has a robust foundation. I do believe one should bring in the resurrection of Christ. It's part of the major witness of the New Testament church. And what I would just wanted to show you, if I may, just briefly as I close, is that there is a wonderful timeline in the Bible the Bible is unique. There is no other book like it which actually talks about a clock and talks about time, past, present, and future. You go to any other religious book, there is no timeline in it. You go to Islam, if they're from a more Muslim background, 
All they've got is a lot of mixture of surahs, verses. But they haven't actually got a timeline. You go to Hinduism, that's got this wheel of, uh, uh, wheel of thinking that, you know, you come back, cycle to something else. It's really just another version of a, a sort of a man-made eternity. There's no concept of an eternity outside this universe. There's no concept of that in Hinduism or in Buddhism which is Buddhism is really an excuse for a sort of a man, an atheism, essentially. Whereas Christianity stands heads and shoulders above every other religion because of its robustness and connection with a real man, the God-man, who bled and died on a cross, who is the one who is described as creating the whole universe, who is recorded as doing, event, doing major miracles right, which showed his deity, which were done in the front of his enemies, right, who could have gainsaid all that, he, all that he did by saying, oh, we saw that was a fake, but they never could do that, could they? And nobody could roll on the dead body of Christ, which is the greatest miracle of all. Now, do you see that using that reasoning, the authority of the Bible, the authority of true history, of course, it knocks away any ideas of eons of prehistory. And by the way, a person who doesn't believe in the authority of the Bible and the authority of Genesis in particular is on a very weak position. If he is in a position trying to argue for the truthfulness of Christianity when he himself doesn't believe in Genesis. So... What's his name, whom you had playing earlier? What was his? William Lane Craig. What a sad case that is. Because he used to believe far more robustly than he does now. But if he's faced in an open-air situation, speaking with a rank atheist, he hasn't got a leg to stand on concerning the true history of the world. And I would say that this is a very powerful point. Because... The robustness of creation leading to the fall, leading to redemption, leading to the time that we're in now and the future judgment to come is a tremendously powerful witness when you really do emphasize the person and the work of Christ and include the resurrection. My time's up, but I hope we did start at 20 past, we finished at 20 past, so... May the Lord bless you all. And if you want to hear more from me tomorrow and Simon, don't forget that we're preaching in the morning and the evening here. That's if you don't have another church to go to. So I hand over, I think, back to Simon or to Neil. I'm not quite sure. Should we pray at the end then? Right, okay, we pray now. Lord, we thank you so much for this church. Thank you for their welcome to us. We thank you, Lord, for the wonder of the gospel. Doesn't it thrill us, those of us who know you well, though we should know you better? We just thank you for saving us. We thank you, Lord, for the wonder of Christ coming from heaven's glory to bleed and to die on a cross to save us. We long to be able to reach more people for Christ, whether it be in the open air, whether it be in personal one-to-one -one witness, whether it be through these wonderful things which are done here in this very building where Ukrainians and others um, are met and other people in the area of Motherwell here who are, have some uh, food here and are reached. Um, please, Lord, bless the witness of this church week by week and all that they do. Bless others, Lord. I've been speaking with Charles and his RTN work and the wonderful stuff he's doing using the media. Lord, bless him and use those videos of the gospel which he is presenting to others far and wide. We pray, gracious God, you bless our homes that we go to. Bless, Lord, tomorrow on the Sunday as we meet round uh, the word of God as we Think more particularly of our blessed Saviour and what he's done for us. Lord, bless the talks by Simon, including tomorrow evening. Thank you, Father, for his clear 
statements as to the greatness of the Creator and the greatness of our same Lord Jesus as our Redeemer. Bless the work of answers in Genesis. May it reach out into many new areas. Thank you for expanding the work into Spain, Italy, and other countries that I know Simon is going to. Bless him. Use him mightily. Thank you for Neil. Thank you, Lord, for his labors over decades. We're so grateful for him. And whatever his future is, Lord, please encourage him greatly. Thank you, Father, for the leaders of this church and bless them and mightily use this work at Motherwell for the sake, not of themselves, but for the name of Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.